and share. Nice. All righty, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to the Financial Fit Bootcamp 2023. How to build your wealth using 1031 exchanges with me, your host, Asad Ahmad, and Nathan Webb with American Accommodators, the 1031 guy. A little bit about Thank myself. You. A little bit about myself, the FitBiz CPA. I'm the managing partner for the CPA firm, the FitBiz, down in Orlando, Florida. We have clients in Jacksonville, Miami, and Tampa as well. That's the website. And now the host, the, the, the main show, uh, the 1031 guy, Nathan Webb at Exchange Executive American Accommodators, AA1031.com. Nathan, thank, welcome to the show and take it away. Yeah, thank you for having me, Asad. Um, yeah, I do 1031 exchanges as a qualified intermediary or accommodator. Um, I do a lot of advisement for clients who are exchanging anything from, you know, single family Airbnb rentals up to multi-level syndicated deals, multifamily net lease. Um, so a lot of things qualify for a 1031 exchange, but the biggest thing that most people just need to know is that, well, what is it, right? And it is a an IRS regulated section of tax code that says, hey, you don't have to pay any taxes as long as you sell real property, go through a qualified intermediary and buy real property of equal or greater value. Um, and so a lot of people do that. They pay no taxes that would normally be due on sale, um, which are include state and federal capital gains, as well as depreciation recapture. And in some cases, if the investment is large enough, which is, you know, gets there pretty quickly, um, net investment income tax. So all of those little taxes add up, um, can often result in 20 to 30 percent uh, or more of the of the sale price or at least the appreciated value. Um, and that's a lot of tax savings. That's a lot of equity that can be rolled into additional property and keep kind of the growth snowball going. Um, what's interesting is any U.S. taxpayer can do this uh, so long as they own property that is in, its intended use is income or investment property. They've had it for two years or at least two tax seasons. Um, they can perform a 1031 exchange. It is a it is a transaction. It is a process. Um, but um, a lot of people do those on their investment properties. Um, the main benefits of this for a lot of people is like, hey, it's it's the snowball, right? So these taxes are deferred. Right. So you can continue to just kind of put more and more money into real estate, not have to take a tax hit and try to reinvest after that tax hit. But as long as all of those proceeds go into the sale, uh, go to a qualified intermediary and go into another real piece of property that is intended for income or investment, you know, you can increase your cash flow. You can make a have it appreciate even more through a value add strategy, including, you know, throw in some other depreciation strategies. Or even uh, you know put new financing on it to um, pull equity out tax free, um, but it's it's really just a, a snowball effect that the 1031 provides, and then actually you can do this for life, right? So you can continue to do a 1031 exchange. Oh, it's just deferred, meaning you'll owe those taxes, but if you set it up correctly, you can have your heirs inherit the property, you know, or you know, the other investments, the portfolio that you've built, and they take what's called a step up in basis, meaning, and you can speak to this more, Asad, like they're not, um, they're basically forgiven, right? So the taxes that I would owe if I were the exchanger, I pass it on to my kids. They don't owe those taxes anymore. So they inherit the property at that stepped up basis. All those taxes just kind of disappear and go away. And it's really, really cool to like, hey, you know, like, yeah, this is IRS sanctioned, but, uh, the IRS doesn't get that money at the end of the day. Yes, it's a stepped up basis is amazing. It's beautiful. A lot of our clients have gone through that. And it, it's it's just a loophole that's legal and, and, and people take advantage of it. Absolutely. So there are some rules and regulations with it, right? They've been outlined in the tax code. They've been outlined by the IRS. They've said, hey, this is what has to take place. And our role as an accommodator or a qualified intermediary is, hey, we facilitate that, but also we have to you know, facilitate the exchange, but we have to document it. We have to report these things, right? And that report goes to your CPA for tax filing or how well, you know, if it was fully deferred, partially deferred, not deferred at all for whatever reason, 
Um, but you know, we have to actually hold those, those proceeds during the process and follow those rules on behalf of the client. They can't ask us, Hey, I want to do it this way. Well, that doesn't work for the tax code. So we're, we're in that, that it's literally intermediary space. We're in between these, these two properties. We're required by the IRS. Um, we report to the IRS. We also report to you, but we have to follow the rules. Um, so some of those are, it has to be real property, can't be personal property. It also needs to be investment property held for income or investment purposes. That's a little ambiguous, right? But really what it, what it says is like, this can be any kind of real property, meaning residential, commercial, raw land, fractional interests in Delaware statutory trusts, tenant and common interests with syndications, even oil and gas royalties are considered mineral rights and that's real property. All of those qualify. And what doesn't qualify is personal residences. If this is intent for home, right? That's not income or investment purposes. So those don't qualify. There are other tax breaks for those personal residences, but you can swap into any one of those things at any one time back and forth, you know, divide and diversify or consolidate. There's a lot of ways that you can exercise the 1031 exchange to make your portfolio into what you want. It's all there for investment purposes, right? Absolutely. When you get into the actual exchange, you're you're signing a tax deferred exchange agreement. You're, you're working with a qualified intermediary. You close on your property. You have these 45 and 180 day identification rules. Um, and you also need to purchase replacement property value that's equal to or greater than the property you relinquished in value. Meaning like if I sold a property for 500,000, I need to buy $500,000 worth of property or more. It doesn't have to be one. It can be two properties. It can be more. Um, and you also need to use 100% of those proceeds in order for it to be fully tax deferred, right? So as long as you're using all the money, buying bigger and better property, you get that full tax deferral. And I often work with CPAs and attorneys. You know, I always say, hey, talk with your CPA. They're the one handling the taxes. I'm just doing this required work for as a qualified intermediary. I don't do your taxes for you. I don't know how much is actually being deferred. I can give you like a high level rundown, but if you want those specifics, definitely talk to your CPA. And so that's what I always encourage people to do um, when they do that. And, and they're also gonna have to file that final report in form 8824 for you. I can't do that for you. So those are just some of the rules that we abide by and we work with your other advisors to make this uh, as smooth as possible. Um, so the 45 and 180 day rules are big ones. Um, but I like to tell people it's like 45 days to identify and also add any additional properties to a single exchange if that's what you want. So you can actually sell two or three properties and put it all into one exchange so long as you get them added within those 45 days. Most people bypass this by doing a portfolio sale. And then if you identify on day 45, you're basically just saying, hey, I intend to close on these this property that I designated. Um, give me the remaining 180 days, so 135 at that point, to actually close on it, which most people do, right? So sometimes these closing can take 90 days or more, um, and especially for larger commercial properties. So the IRS does give you a full 180 days to close. You just have to do that designation on day 45. And both of those start at the closing date of the relinquished property. So if you closed today, you'd have 45 days from today. If you close next month, it'd be 45 days from that closing date that gets recorded by your closing agent. Um, so I, but I always like to tell people, look at that 45 days as like, hey, you have the option to extend for another 135 days to actually close or not. You could, you could fail your exchange. There's no penalty for failing an exchange. You just don't get the tax deferral unless you do it correctly. Um, some people get a little confused with the designation rules, um, but really they start with, you can identify up to three properties they can be any value and you can close on any number of them. There's no additional restrictions. You don't have to evaluate them. You don't have to say what percentage you're buying necessarily. You're just saying, hey, I, I wanna buy this, this or this, and you can close on any one of them. You, you have options. Um, but how the IRS restricts you from buying, you know, just identifying the entire MLS, for example, or a, you know, a giant geographical code is that it says, well, if you actually identify more than three properties and you have a couple rules that you have to follow, this is where some people get hung up. Um, and this is, doesn't happen too often. Actually, most people are, they know where they're going. They're identifying one property, maybe two. 
um, with a backup, you know, something that, hey, maybe I, I know this DST is available if I really want it. But there are some people who are really diversifying. And so I want to buy this house and want to put a piece of it over here into this tenant in common deal with a syndicator and this piece over here into a Delaware statutory trust. And that's where the 200% rule comes in first, which says, hey, if you're identifying, let's say, four properties, as long as the total aggregate value of those four properties is not 200% or 2x of what you relinquished, right? So if you sold for 500,000, don't identify more than a million dollars in property, right? To replace it with. And, and usually that's the case, but you could close on two of those properties if you wanted, or three. Um, usually you're, identif you're, you're buying more than half of what you identify with that 200% rule. Um, but that's, that's why that's there. And then the other one is like, hey, if you wanted to buy even more than that, then you're gonna get hit with the 95% rule. So that basically says, whatever you identify, it could be 10 properties, you better close on 95% of that identified value, basically all of them, right? So, I mean, if you identify 20, you'd still have to buy 19 of them or 95% of the value, one of, one of those things. And so the 95% rule doesn't come into play that often, but it is there. Usually you're the three property rule, sometimes the 200% rule, um, but that's, that's the gist of how those designation rules work. Got it. Yeah. And, no. you know, I get a lot of these kind of questions. The first one that comes up is if I closed on my property last week, but I haven't cast a check, I have it in hand. Can I still do a 1031 exchange? The short answer is no. Yeah. You actually have to assign those proceeds to a QI. The settlement statement has to be updated. You have to sign all the contracts with the qualified intermediary to, to meet the, the compliance of the section 1031, you just, you have to do it. So uh, we can't retroactively do that. We can't retroactively change the settlement statement. So you have to get your accommodator involved during escrow so that all of that paperwork can be done that basically says, hey, I'm doing a 1031 exchange. And then that's also how the closing date gets recorded for your 1031 file is on that settlement statement. So short answer is talk to your QI, before you sell or at least during escrow, but don't ever call them afterwards thinking you can do a 1031 because that's not how it works. Um, some people will ask me, well, how much am I actually saving? Is the 1031, is me doing a 1031 actually worth it? And I, I can't answer that question to the specific detail. That's what you talked to us odd about, right? It's like, hey, how much capital gains have I had? How much depreciation have I taken? And what would the depreciation recapture be? What would my taxes be? Depends on the state. Depends on your taxpayer status. Depends on so many things that I just don't have the information for. I could roughly calculate your depreciation and your your appreciation, your capital gains, but I don't know those exact numbers. But you know, sometimes giving a rough estimate can just make people realize, oh, is this worth it or not? Oftentimes it is. Um, I have had people say, I need to do a 1031, but they haven't actually seen any gain. You know, I bought it for 500 and I'm selling it for 500. And I'm like, you don't need me. <laughs> just sell it, right? Um, you know, maybe there's some depreciation recapture they're worried about, but not if they've owned it for a couple of years. Usually it's not worth it. Um, so I get that sometimes. 1031 is usually worth it though. Um, if they want to take money out, right, of the exchange, um, you know, can I do that? Yes, you can. It's called boot in our industry. And really boot is just any value, whether debt or equity, that is taken as, as cash or not replaced in that replacement value that we talked about. So you can take out some proceeds, but where some people get hung up is they're like, well, I put a hundred thousand down on this $500,000 property. It was only worth 300 at the time, right? I want to take my hundred thousand dollars back because that's my original equity. I already paid taxes on that and it's appreciated 200,000 in value. Well, you, you could take it out, but it's not, it, it'll still be taxed because the IRS doesn't differentiate, differentiate between appreciation and your original equity. All those proceeds need to go forward into the next property because the IRS can't differentiate, right? So they're, they're going to say, nope, you didn't take out your equity. You took out your appreciation. So we're going to tax you on that. So you can do it. Just realize you will be liable for taxes to some amount. If you're trying to take out more money then it's actually appreciated. That nullifies the exchange in essence, certainly for capital gains. So just be aware of that. 
again, that's something to talk to your CPA about. Um, and then oftentimes I get, well, what if I, I fail or I don't, you know, do a fully tax deferred exchange? Um, and, you know, this is something I often talk about is like, well, you, you may still realize some gains, right? But maybe you can write off some losses. So you can fail your exchange with me, get your funds back. You'll owe a tax liability, but you're in the same tax year. Go into something that, you know, can you can write off some losses. And, you know, we talk about this quite a bit. Assad, like it's like cost segregation is one of those ways that you can, you know, if you do a cost segregation study, you're basically getting a lot of massive depreciation that first year and some bonus depreciation that could offset a good amount. Right. So right. that's a that's a consideration for a lot of people who, you know, maybe they fail or they they left some money on the table. Is there another way that I can incur some losses this year to offset those gains? Um, and that's something that I, I tell people is out there, but they have to find the property and they have to do that cost segregation study in order to make that happen. Absolutely. And now, now, now Nathan, uh, I had another question for you. Have you heard about the reverse 1031 exchange where people yeah. buy the property first, sell their later uh, and because they're having problems selling the property they have currently. Have you seen that or do you deal with that? Yeah, we, we've done those. Um, you, the hardest part of a reverse exchange is your money is locked up in the property you're trying to sell. How right. are you going to purchase the property that you're, you're buying? And I, I can't make that money come out of thin air. It has to come from somewhere. But maybe there's a lender who would be willing to, you know, short-term loan to actually give you the equity that you need. But essentially a reverse is, well, we're going to, we want to, we know what our replacement is. We can do that. So we actually have to put in a title holder on your behalf to hold that property has to use your money to hold that equity position. And then you'd have 180 days to sell your property that you're trying to. And then we swap those funds out essentially Perfect. and swap title out. So that's how a reverse works. That's usually the biggest hurdle that people have. Um, right. It's like, well, I don't have the money to do a reverse. And it's like, I mean, that's, that's often the case, but just so you're aware, very possible. Does it always make sense? No. Um, but sometimes it does. I mean, the very sophisticated investors utilize reverse exchanges all the time because they already know what they want to buy. They're not under the gun to have to buy something because they're in an exchange dealing with that 45 days. Right. They found it. Let, let's fund this with cash because they're going to get that cash back. It's all going to be tax free, tax deferred. Right. But they just needed those initial proceeds to make it happen. Got it. Perfect. Thanks for the explanation, Nathan. Gotcha. Did you want to touch on this as well a little bit on depreciation issues? Um, well, I mean, this is where it really segues into more more of yours. And, and we talked about, you know, yes. when you're hitting depreciation, right, there's recapture that you have to pay, but it's deferred through a 1031. So depreciation yes. recapture is 25% of whatever you've depreciated. Um, but you know, and so cost segregation front loads a lot of that, but you can save, you know, you can not have to pay that depreciation recapture if you exchange. The issue that a lot of people come up with is like, well, that basis doesn't doesn't change, right? So you still right. have so much you can depreciate. Yes. So it's it's kind of a double-edged sword, right? It, so, it is. It, it is because because the basis remains of that old property and that old property may be 100K and but then the new property might be much higher in fair market value, but your basis is going to be the same 100K right. that you that you uh, 1031 exchanged for this new property. So so that exactly. is that is one of the main issues investors have. So so to, to tackle those issues, what we'd like to do is we like to talk about cost segregation. And this is where Nathan Nathan brought up the cost segregation. Maybe perhaps it could be an alternative alternative to a 1031 exchange. But a cost segregation is very, very powerful. A lot of our investor clients, we do these eight to 10 a month. They're high W-2, high net worth investors. They're maybe they're doctors or engineers. But cost segregation is one of the most powerful tools for the real estate investor to accelerate depreciation. That means accelerate losses on their tax returns every year and move from a higher tax bracket to a lower tax bracket. So let's say you're 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 paying over thirty percent in taxes. You might be able to lower your tax bracket to twelve percent or ten percent, 
with a cost segregation study. Uh, of obviously, there are rules with this. There are certain bonus depreciation phase outs that are now happening. Uh, this will reduce to 80% in 2023. And subsequently, 20% remaining will be eliminated in 2027. So that means time is running out, guys. This is the best time to get in touch with somebody like Nathan or somebody like myself who can advise you on cost segregation studies because time is running out. And 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 and, and the power of a cost seg is when, when we can basically, if you purchase a property that's a million bucks or maybe 500K, you can depreciate 30 to 40% of that value through a cost segregation study. So that means, so that means you, you, you have a $300,000 loss. And this first year, you can take $60,000 or $80,000 in, 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 in a tax write-off on your return. And that could potentially be a massive refund on your return. Uh, a lot of our investor clients are also investing in real estate syndicates. So real estate syndicates are beautiful because this is this tool allows you investors out there to just be passive investors, be limited partners, let the GPs manage the syndication, but the depreciation via the cost segregation study then flows through to your K1 and that K1 is now on your 1040. That means Maybe you're a doctor, engineer, you're a high net worth individual. Maybe you're making 500K a year. Now you're in a much lower tax bracket because you've reduced your taxable income. And maybe you're getting a refund at the end of the year, or maybe your taxable income is zero. Uh, your, your income taxes are zero due to the accelerated depreciation and loss. Again, a lot, some of our investor clients come to us, ask us about, about cost segregation studies. They're CPAs, they're accountants are generalists. That means they're not specialized in real estate and they don't understand that you can take this retroactively. You'll be able to claim this depreciation expense uh, even in the first year of ownership. So let's say you bought a property this year, boom, we can do a cost segregation study on that. We can go ahead and, and, and do a detailed in-depth study so that you can take the losses in the first year. This is just a quick example guys, of what a true cost segregation looks like. Uh, a cost seg so when, when, when people buy a property, they, they're, they're, they, get, they think they're buying pretty much everything. They think they're buying the land and the property that, 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 that's on the land. And they think they can depreciate the land. The land does not depreciate. Land is depleted, which is a different term. But depreciation is what we're looking for. And the building has all these components within the the, the, the house. The building has HVAC, plumbing, uh, cabinetry, lighting. All of these things can be reclassed from 27 and a half year or 39 year property to five, 10, 12 year property, which accelerates the depreciation. And in a cost segregation study, you can include land improvements, personal property, building, everything uh, which which uh, increases the value uh, that you will receive at the end of the day with a cost segregation study. Obviously, multifamily buildings, motels, these are great candidates for a cost seg, but we have done or we've helped our clients do engineering-based studies on residential properties. So if, if, if the high the more uh, the more your property is worth, the better results you will get with a cost segregation. Uh, you definitely want to have over half a million in, uh, in, in, pro in worth of property to do the segregation study. You can also do do-it-yourself studies, but those are prone to IRS audits. So you want to work with a qualified cost segregation company, engineering-based, who can produce that thick book. Because at the end of the day, our clients get a very, very thick book with all these hundreds of pages and at the back at the end you'll see the justification for reclassing property to five year or ten year and taking that uh, accelerated depreciation uh, wanted to share a quick example with you guys uh, one of our clients joe and cassie recently purchased a multi-family four-unit apartment in the orlando florida area for nine hundred and fifty thousand dollars they hired a firm to do a cost segregation analysis. Now we have a team that we work with that's engineering based 
engineering specialized that does and sends out uh, their uh, uh, their team members at the site, and then they produce that uh, depreciation study. And we were able to write off approximately 30% of the purchase price of this property. And then they, they found out within the first five years, they can depreciate around $285,000 and take a tax loss of up to $60,000 each year. This was big for them because they were able to, instead of paying $100,000, up to $100,000 in taxes, they saw a 60% reduction in their tax liability. And, and the following years, because they could carry forward the loss, they were able to completely eliminate their liability uh, going forward. Um, so a cost segregation is amazing. Nathan, did you have any points to add? Yeah, I, I just wanted to bring up for you. So you also get the bonus depreciation in year one. So you get a big boost in your year one, but then you're, this, this couple was writing off 60,000 per year for the next five years as well, which yes. is off, also offset against their income. So it, it gave them a big loss in year one and then gave them continual tax savings over the next five years. That's exactly right. This this is something that can be used in future years against future W-2, 1099 business income. It reduces it. It gets it out the way. And if, if, if you think about it, if you were an investor and you were doing cost segregations, 1031 exchanges, um, you know, and using real estate professional status for the past decade, you're probably a millionaire right now, right? You're probably sitting on millions and millions of dollars of rental portfolio income. Our accounting director behind me, James, he invests in syndications and he's he's a, a short-term rental investor himself. He purchases construction properties, uh, new, new construction every year, does a cost segregation study, gets anywhere from thirty-five dollars to $40,000 in refunds from the IRS. So you, so you can see the benefits of doing a cost segregation study. It is powerful, um, but you gotta get in touch with a good CPA team to help you. Yeah, with and and also on this, so if they if they took, um, you know, 30%, $300,000 year one, and then $60,000 for the next five years, <coughs> excuse me, if they sold in year five, they've they've had all of that depreciation, right? So they've, they've kept more of their income, which is great, but now they'd owe depreciation recapture of 25% of whatever they depreciated in five years, which was a lot. Yes. You know, what is that? Um, like $600,000. That 25% is a lot. of that would be owed. You just 1031 out of that and go into another property. You can still continue the depreciation, right? right? And you can be buying another property that you can get that bonus depreciation on that one. What, meanwhile, you're just writing the cash flow. That's something you've deferred the taxes on via 1031. So they work in tandem all the time. Exactly. There are there. It's it's like a it's like a duo. It's it's a great duo that that it just it just it just accelerates your wealth building, your rental portfolio, and it avoid. And then, as Nathan mentioned in the earlier slides, your estate gets stepped up basis. So it's it, you never have to worry about paying taxes, and because you're using all these strategies that that are legal. In, in, yeah. in according to the IRS, so it's it's a yeah. full uh, um, strategy to to An use. Another another thing that um, I've had clients do is they've um, you know they failed to uh, talk to me and use a qualified intermediary, so they sold a, a million dollar property, and they're like, "Wow, we have to pay all these capital gains now. What can we do?" Right, And the, the answer was, well, find something that you can cost segregate, whether that's uh, an apartment deal or, you know, you can go into a net lease for a gas station or like an auto mechanic shop where it has a lot more personal property or improvements to, right. fund, to run that business. That has a huge amount of cost segregation, bonus depreciation that you can take. And you can just hold that for a couple of years and then exchange tax free into the property you want. They wanted an Airbnb on the coast. Right. Which a lot of people do in Florida. And so it's yeah. like, yeah, you just you just you can do these things together or in tandem backwards and forwards. It's just talking to the right experts, doing it the right way to accomplish your goals. But the tax savings are there. You just have to use them. Exactly. And you're so right about Florida and the vacation rentals. You've, you've been helping clients in Jacksonville, St. Augustine, and they're all about 
buying that coastal condo or property, which can then help them save on taxes. So maybe they're breaking even in the first year with the cash flow and expenses, but then the cost seg and depreciation helps them go to a lower tax bracket. And if you're saving 50 to 60 grand every year in taxes, you can just roll that over as a down payment for another property. And there you go. Right. And it's, it's, uh, it's That's magic. exactly it. Uh, it's magic. And, uh, and yeah, and then you can also do real estate professional status on ATMs, alternative investments, gas stations, self storage units are also getting big now. Um, so doing cost segregations and bonus depreciation on that is very uh, lucrative uh, as well. Yeah. Uh, so now uh, one thing you can't depreciate or do cost segregation is on raw land. Yes. No, like you can't do that. Or, and you can't also, you can't also do mineral rights. So I have people exchange into oil and gas royalties, which is possible, but they just have to realize that they're not getting, you know, any depreciation benefits or it's not cost segregation benefits either. However, right. there's depletion benefits off of oil and gas and there, there could be massive improvements made to that raw land to, you know, bolster some appreciation in the future, do some new construction do some write-offs on the improvements. But um, again, these things are working in tandem and there's a lot of things you can exchange into. There's a lot of things that are going to have better depreciation than others, but it's right. understanding those things. just part of the education, right? Understanding how this works, what's going to work best for your situation and then making the right choices. But taxes are our biggest expense. If you think about it, right? This is they where are. you get your savings. It's not, it's not, not buying Starbucks, right? It's, <laughs> it's like, no, save money in your taxes the right way legally that's allowable. And that's going to save you a lot more than, you know, not not buying Starbucks. Right. It's it's it's, it's the big wins versus the smaller, smaller wins uh, that, that, that we need to look at the bigger picture. Uh, I was going to ask you a little bit about um, some other alternative investments as well. Nathan, I don't know if you were aware of the qual the, uh, the qualified opportunity funds. Uh, I, 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 I've heard a lot of equity investors and people with big stock portfolios who are facing capital gains. They use those uh, as as well, but I think that's not that's 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 not as not not heard as much in the real estate investing community. Uh, the, the... Right, and uh, you could probably speak a little bit more on these. Uh, but my I I say that you can use a qualified opportunity zone fund or or just you know buying property in that qualified opportunity zone for you get short-term tax deferral. So I think it's like, it's just mm -hmm. delayed. Your taxes are delayed on those gains for a couple of years, but you're usually, if you're in a fund, you're going into new construction that will be done by those times, by the time those taxes are due, right? So you don't have to pay on them this year. You, you pay on them in the future. And usually by then the construction's done and the team is refinancing the property. So you're getting money out tax-free that you can use to take to pay the tax bill and get cash flow, but then if there is a sale going forward, then you know that as long as you've held it for a long enough period of time, then you owe those capital gains are forgiven essentially. So it's another strategy for my space in the 1031 world. It's like, hey, this is a backup option for your failed 1031, right? Or you didn't do it, or maybe you just have a few more gains you want to offset, right? You that is an opportunity, but. If you're looking for everything this year, cost segregation is kind of the other out, right? Got it. Got it. You and can't 1031 into, into a fund or into a syndication. You have to do a syndication through tenants in common, but you, you can't go into a fund that's considered personal property, not real property. Uh, but that is a, it is an option, right? It's, it's figuring out what it is you want to do, but there are options available. Absolutely. And that's what we want. We want to give our investors options and opportunities to go out there and do what's best for them. But you can't do that without having a good team around you, a good team member like Nathan who can help you with 1031 exchanges, uh, a good CPA firm who can help you with the real estate strategies and really get the best bang for your buck. Um, now, Let's let's uh, let's go to our our uh, audience here. Do any of you have any questions regarding ten thirty ones? I just appreciate the chance to ch ch chime in. Uh, no, it's really good information. I was just here uh, learning more about ten thirty ones. I get 
as a lender, a loan officer with a broker in Florida here, wanted to brush up, hear more about it and see what kind of strategies you guys are using. Um, you know, certainly not my specialty, but definitely get occasional referral or realtor asking me about 1031s if they don't specialize in them. So more I can learn and be of use and, and value um, or refer them to the, the right people. It's always a winning combination. So. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Appreciate it. Anything, anything specific on 1031s or cost segregation that we can help answer? Um, I think there was, uh, the most recent one was a realtor that had a guy, he was, it was regarding LLC structure and he was going from one investment that was a single member. And then he was trying to do a 1031 exchange into a, another investment property and include a business partner in the LLC. So more on like the legal side. Yeah. And I, I cover a lot of those too, and because there are certain rules that, that do that. The 1031 is tax code and it's real estate legalities. And it's, it's kind of playing in the gray of both of those, right? Like I'm not your tax advisor and I'm not your real estate professional, even though I am like not your attorney, right? It's like, I'm an investor as well. And I've done so many of these, but what, what you'd have to do in that case is you can't change taxpayers during a 1031 exchange. So if Justin is selling a property, Justin also needs to be buying a property. Justin can't change his LLC and include Nathan and we buy a property together. That's changing a taxpayer. That's now a partnership, not just, just Justin's taxes, right? So you can't change that. But what we could do is you buy a certain percentage of the building as a tenant in common so that way you're buying a real percentage of the property and that could be 20%, 50%, 80%, doesn't matter, whatever makes sense for the deal. And then you're bringing in Nathan and he may have some value he's adding. He's at, he's got some capital he's adding, but we buy it as tenants in common. And we're, we both have our percentage of real property. We still are both on title. We're both signing on the loan. Um, it's just sometimes some lenders are like, I don't, I don't want to do a tenant in common kind of thing. I just want one LLC. And that's, that's where you would come in. And, you know, as long as your firm can understand and underwrite that and approve the loan, um, I do those all the time. That's how you would, that's how you would effectively do a 1031 in that situation. But I answer those questions too, all the time, including breaking up partnerships. How would we break up a partnership and do a 1031? There's ways you can and ways you can't. Very cool. Yeah, no, definitely good to know. And uh, yeah, I think they had a, I think a, the agent involved was that the you term was it QI was that is that like the yeah qualified intermediary QI or yeah, combinator yeah I think they I think they got it taken care of but yeah I, I certainly didn't uh, know that so didn't know how to respond but yeah it was definitely uh, a lot to learn so appreciate the info that awesome thank you Justin anybody else you can write your questions or ask them on on, on video whatever you'd like. Uh, There's a lot, lot to go through with 1031s and and real estate professional status, cost eggs. It's 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 so much and it can get overwhelming. So having a good team is very important. Uh, any 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 fun scenarios that have come across your table, Nathan, so far or this week? I mean, I I get fun scenarios all the time. <laughs> uh, it, I don't want to bore people to death with with. Uh, legalities that you know i have to run people through or you know i'm i'm often dealing with llc structures and partnerships um which which is kind of curious because you can structure buyouts of personal property on the front end or back end of a 1031 exchange um you know if you have a cash is king in that sense right it's like if i have the ability to buy out my partner cash and then do the exchange or, you know, I don't mind taking a gain because I'm, I'm going to get some bonus depreciation this year with cost segregation. You know, maybe my partner exchanges and buys me out and I'm happy to take that gain. Um, There's some really interesting things you can do. Right. Um, and including like reverse exchanges, right. Or, or build to suit exchanges. You can, you can do those things. Um, they just require, again, they require a qualified intermediary to be the title holder. And so you have to work in tandem with your accommodator on everything. Um, but it, there's so, there's so many ways and so many things that, that qualify. I have a lot of people in this day and age who, um, they want to sell single family, 
right? So here's something I'm working on right now. You know, I have someone who's selling single family and they have a portfolio and they're really looking to retire, right? And so they want to diversify. So they don't want to sell like 15, 16 single family rentals and buy one necessarily apartment building. They're looking to retire. They don't really want to manage. So what, what can or should they do? And like most investments, diversification is key. Um, so we can introduce them to Delaware statutory trust sponsors, um, other multifamily like syndication sponsors who are very good at taking 1031 funds and, and writing those appropriately and doing the accounting for those appropriately. Because again, you're not buying as a limited partnership into that syndication. You're buying a portion of title as a tenant in common but there's additional paperwork involved. There's the IRS has given guidelines for how those are done and still considered a safe harbor for a 1031 exchange. And then you have oil and gas royalties. You have, you know, maybe there's, maybe I want, they want to buy a condo. So I have people who want to buy three or four things or different avenues of investment to diversify, get the income and, and still remain tax deferred and passive. Um, and so being able to sell, Multiple properties in one go, yes, can can do that through a 1031. Needs to be very, very structured. Everybody needs to be on the same page, but we can do that. And you can also go into multiple properties all via one exchange, right? You can go into a Delaware, Sash this particular client's going into a Delaware Sashroy Trust. He's looking at another tenant in common deal with a sponsor on new construction where they can, you know, if it's like a $4 million total portfolio sale, put a million dollars in each place, right? So million dollars to apartment in Florida, million dollars into a diversified Delaware statutory trust with properties all over the United States. So that's again, diversified income. It's very stabilized. Whereas the, the syndications probably got some more value add, got some, a real big uh, bonus um, appreciation. They're probably gonna see which they'll 1031 again, you know, five years down the road. And then you get some oil and gas royalties that are paying, you know, double digits and cash flow with depletion benefits. And then you got your condo on the beach that, hey, maybe I'm doing Airbnb, uh, but I'm spending a, a few weeks out of the year, you know, on the beach as well, while I'm just living life. And that's all tax deferred, complete, very, very passive. And you're getting the best of all the worlds, right? And you're able to walk into retirement and they've got these, this set up in a living trust. They're going to pass it on their kids. Their kids are going to pay nothing. Their kids yeah. are going to inherit those properties, all those cash flows. And then they can sell them as soon as they inherit them and walk away with a hundred percent of the, the equity that, you know, this client has seen over the 20, 30 years they've been investing. Like it's incredible. I love doing that. I love seeing that. I love seeing the success on the back end because Asad, you and I are, relatively young, right? We're investing ourselves, but this is such a cool way to see that happening, actually happening, the the, the long game panning out perfectly um, right. for people um, through 1031s, through cost segregation, through just using what is available to us as taxpayers that are benefits. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Nathan. Uh, now tell us how people can reach you and, and how can they reach out to you or your firm or your company and, and stay in touch? Yeah, um, I'm I'm a phone call away. I'm happy to give people my phone number because I have some people who just need some questions answered regarding a 1031 exchange. Um, usually if I answer them, they use me, right? Because they're actually talking to the person who does them. They're not, you know, talking around in a circle. So I give people my phone number, which is 470-387. Guess the last four digits, 1031, right? So um that's what that's my phone number 470-387-1031 or they can my name is nathan our company is american accommodators or aa1031.com they can reach me on my email nathan at aa1031.com i'm happy to answer questions right even if it's just hey my client has this question or i'm considering a 1031 does this make sense i don't need to take your business if you don't need one right you probably you may just need to be referred to a good cpa like Assad and and I'm happy to make that referral too. Just push, point you in the right direction. That's my that's my goal. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Nathan. And if anybody has any other questions, you can go now. If not, we will be sending this recording out to everybody on our newsletter list. Uh, we will be, and, and Nathan will be sharing this with his 
uh, with, with his uh, subscribers as well. So this will be on YouTube. This will be on Instagram, on uh, on our Facebook. And thank you so much, Nathan. I appreciate you coming on and, and looking forward to doing more future webinars. Gotcha. Thanks for having me. All righty. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.